Jesus was asked a very important question regarding salvation by an unknown inquirer as to the number of individuals or number of those who would be saved. In our lesson this morning, we want to look at this question and Jesus' response. We find the exchange in Luke, the 13th chapter, verse 23 and verse 24, when it says, Then said one unto him, Lord, are there few that be saved? And he said unto them, Strive to enter in at the straight gate. For many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in, and shall not be able. <clears throat> this question, are there few that are saved, that will be saved? We don't know what was in the mind of the questioner here, but possibly he knew his Bible history and was thinking about the possibility of some specific instances. As we go back in the history of the Old Testament, we come to Genesis the 6th, 7th, and 8th chapters. <clears throat> And those familiar with the Bible and with Genesis will recognize that this is the time of the flood. At the time of the flood, we do not know. The Bible doesn't give us specifically the population of the world. As people have tried to figure up population and based upon uh, the growth, number of children, and so forth, the lower estimates of the population at that time was 195 million. However, some have estimated it on the high side of upward to 122 billion. Now then, if you know the population of the world today, it's just under 8 billion. So just consider that, possibly upward to 122 billion people living at that time. A more reasonable estimate, though, would still place the number at around 15 billion people that were living on the earth at the time of the flood. Uh, that's not quite or twice as many as what we have in the world today, but it's close to it. So the world was very populated, though. The point is, there's a lot of people on the world. It might help us when we understand God stating that the imagination of man's heart was only evil continually. But we also, of that number of people who lived, we are introduced in Genesis, well, I want to mention chapter 7 and verse 1 in particular, that the Lord said unto Noah, Come thou and all thy house into the ark, for thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation. Of those numbers, however many it might have been, whether it be even 195 million or all the way up to 122 billion, however many, Noah was found righteous and he was the only one. And thus God said to him, you know, build an ark, for the saving of you and your house. Peter, in recalling this in 1 Peter, the third chapter and verse 20, would state, which sometimes were disobedient, when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while, in, uh, while the ark was preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls, were saved by water. So out of that millions probably billions of people that were upon the earth, only eight souls were saved. 
maybe the questioner had in mind that time frame and all of that number of people and only eight people saved during that time. Are there few that enter? Well, certainly you could say that few entered at that time. We start understanding a little bit as to what few is from a biblical standpoint, even from that early time frame. But as we go through that Bible history, we come to Genesis, the 18th and 19th chapter. <clears throat> this is the story of Lot. And we already know that he had pitched his tent towards Sodom because the fertile plain that was there and that was conducive to his cattle, all of the goods which he had. And so he moved there, not thinking of his spiritual welfare, but the physical welfare. <clears throat> Again, we're not given the population of Sodom, Gomorrah, and the cities of the plain. Again, I've seen estimates of, low estimates of Sodom being uh, 500,000 people. And it goes up from there. We don't know. But prior to God destroying Sodom, Gomorrah, the cities of the plain, he tells Abraham what he's going to do. <clears throat> Abraham said, would you spare the city for 50 people? Fifty righteous people out of all this number in Sodom, Gomorrah, and the cities of the plain. And yes, God would have spared it. But then we start seeing the, for lack of a better term, the negotiations. What about 45? What about 40? Well, what about 30? What about 20? What about 10? Ten righteous souls among all of these cities. All of these people, ten righteous souls, and will you spare the city? And God says, I'll spare the city for ten righteous souls. <clears throat> ten righteous souls could not be found. It has been stated, and I think accurately so, that if Lot had saved his house, those of his own family, his children and their families, that there would have been the ten righteous souls. But ten righteous souls could not be found. <clears throat> so God was going to destroy the cities. And he sends two angels there to warn Lot to leave the cities. In Genesis 19 and verse 15, we're told, And when the morning arose, then the angels hastened Lot, saying, Arise, take thy wife and thy two daughters, which are here, lest thou be consumed in the iniquity of this city. You had Lot, his wife, and his two daughters who were going to be saved out of that city, those cities. And the angels saying, Hurry and leave. Otherwise, you'll be destroyed in the city as well. <clears throat> but of course, they are warned by the angels, don't look back. And it states in uh, Genesis 19 and verse 26, but his wife looked back from behind him and she became a pillar of salt. So of these people in the Sodom, Gomorrah, and the cities of the plain, four people were initially going to be saved. One of them looked back and she died, and so three were spared. <clears throat> but, maybe the story should not end there, because as we come to the end of Genesis, the 19th chapter, here is Lot and his two daughters. And they are concerned. Our father is old, verse 31, and there is no man in the earth to come in to us after the manner of all the earth. And so they devised a plan. 
let's get our father drunk. And then the first night, the older daughter was going to come and have sexual relations with her father. Game drunk again the next night, and the younger daughter does the same. And as a result, children were born out of that wicked situation. And so here's Lot, a righteous man. In fact, uh, he is described as his soul being vexed because of the wickedness of the city. But now then, he and his two daughters and his ta- two daughters prove themselves to be wicked themselves. But of the initial four that were going to be saved, only three were spared the destruction of the city, and two of those proved to be wicked. As we continue on in the Scriptures, though, we come to the Israelites. And God had taken through His providence, first Joseph, and then to spare the children of Israel, from the famine that was going to come. And then 70 souls go down into Egypt. While they are there in Egypt, they become a great nation. God had had promised Abraham that he would make of him a great nation. While they were in Egypt, they become a great nation. He's also promised them to give them a land, and now then that promise is going to be fulfilled. He is going to bring them into that promised land. And then there's the ultimate promise, of course, that in they shall all of the families of the earth be blessed, Genesis 12, verses 1 through 3. But now then you have 70 souls going into Egypt. They grow into a great nation. They began crying unto God because they were under bondage. And so God selects Moses and says, You go to Pharaoh and tell Pharaoh to let my people go. He does so. And God, because Pharaoh initially refuses to allow the children of Israel to leave, God, with a powerful hand, brings them out of Egypt out of, out, after those ten plagues. In Exodus, the 12th chapter, in verse 37, it states that the children of Israel journeyed from Ramses to Succoth, about 600,000 on foot that were men beside women or beside children. At that time, 600,000 men. This number, though, we see a few, about three different numbers that are given to us during this period of time. Because in Numbers, the first chapter in verse 46, there is a numbering of the men who were able to go to war. And it that number, and that number is going to exclude everyone who is of the tribe of Levi, because those priests were not men of war, were not to go to war. And so, at that time, it says in Numbers 1 and verse 46, even all that were numbered were 600,000 and 3,550. So 655, uh, 600, let me get this right, 603,550 men of war. That would exclude older men who were not able to go to war. That would exclude women. That would exclude children. That excluded the tribe of Levi. Now then again, people who have done studies along this line trying to figure out population growth and such. If these men of war, 
each had a wife, five children, which would not be all that uncommon in that day. Think of some of the older generation that uh, they had 10, 15 children. So an average of five children at that day would not have been uncommon. And that gives you a population of six million people coming out of Egypt. A large number. The lowest range that I've seen is about two and a half million. The upper range that I have seen personally was seven million. Israelites coming out of Egypt. As we go through that time, God gives unto them the Ten Commandments. They, ten, they send 12 spies into the land to spy out the land. Ten of the spies come back with an evil report. People there are giants. We can't take the land. We're you know, grasshoppers in their sight. Even in our own sight we are. We just don't have the power to do so. Two men, of course, came back with a positive report, even though recognizing the difficulties and the size and all of those things, let us go up at once and take the land. But because the people believe the negative report of the ten spies, God is going to now refuse to allow them to enter into the promised land. They try and go in anyway without God's approval, and they are rebuffed and they begin wandering in the wilderness until that generation dies out. Of that generation, Joshua and Caleb are the only ones that are allowed to enter into the promised land. Notice Numbers 14th chapter and verse 30, (coughs) where he says, Doubtless ye shall not come into the land... (coughs) concerning which I I swear to make you dwell therein, save Caleb, the son of... (coughs) Caleb, the son of Jephthah, and Joshua, the son of Nun. And again, he states it in Numbers, the 26th chapter, in verse 65. For the Lord has said unto them, They shall surely die in the wilderness. And there was not not left a man of them, save... Caleb, the son of Jephthah, and Joshua, the son of Nun. So these 600,000 men that come out of Egypt, only two were allowed to enter into the promised land. Few that be saved? What a question. As we've been studying the book of Isaiah on Wednesday nights, we've talked about that very small remnant that would be saved. A very small remnant of all of the people of Israel, northern, southern kingdoms combined, a very small remnant that would be saved, that would be spared. Few that would be saved. Jesus' response is they needed to strive to enter in. The word strive comes from the Greek word agonizomai. From various lexicons, it means to fight, wrestle, struggle, compete to enter in to enter a contest, contend with an adversary. And probably the mildest word that I found was to make effort. In his dictionary of words, uh, Zodhidus wrote, it also came to mean to take pains, to wrestle as in an, uh, an award contest, straining every nerve to the uttermost toward the goal. When you hear the word agonizomai, you might recognize a couple of English words. Agony. Agonize. That's the idea that this word is expressing. And I like the way in which Zodhide had put it. Straining every nerve to the uttermost toward the goal. 
as Christians, we are to strive. Barnes Notes writes that the word is taken from the Grecian games. In their, <coughs> in their races and wrestling and various athletic exercises, they strove or agonized or put forth all their powers to gain the victory. Thousands witnessed them. They were long trained for the conflict, and the honor of victory was one of the highest honors among the people. So Jesus says that we should strive to enter in, and he means by it that we should be diligent, be active, be earnest, that we should make it our first and chief business to overcome our sinful propensities and to endeavor to enter into heaven. He mentions the Grecian games. Of course, at this period of time within the world today, we have the Olympic games that are going on. Can you imagine, though, anyone getting into the into those Olympics that really didn't care, they didn't uh, exercise, they didn't uh, control their diet, they don't do anything as far as training, and they're making the Olympics. That thought is totally foreign to us because we know that the Olympics <coughs> are the epitome of people's training. They train literally their entire life to attain the gold medal or even a medal or even just, a lot of them, they train their whole life just to get to the games whether they are going to get a medal or not because of the honor of going to the Olympics for their nation. That's someone who has, is striving to get to the Olympics striving to attain that earthly goal. That's the word that Jesus uses in relationship to this question, are there few that enter in? You've got to strive to enter in. You've got to strive to, enter, to live the Christian life. We should know Satan is out to destroy us. Peter describes it in 1 Peter 5 and verse 8, to be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Satan is an adversary. And he is out there, he is trying his, as we might put it, dead level best to destroy us. Everything that is within his power, he is using to try to destroy us, to devour us. We're going to have to strive to live that Christian life because we have a very strong, powerful adversary. Now, he, Peter describes him as a roaring lion. It's not a roaring mouse or a little weakling out here. A lion is the epitome of strength and power. That's Satan. He's not a weakling. He's not an imbecile. He's someone who is strong, who is ever going about using all of his wiles, all of his strength to try to devour the Christian, to devour you and me. And the temptation is strong. 1 John 2 and verse 16, John describes it, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the vain glory or pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lusts thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Those lusts, those desires that are within us, Satan is going to use every one that he can to try to destroy us. We have a strong adversary. 
But in addition to that, there is always the temptation that is before us to become lackadaisical. Just, we're, we grow tired, don't we? We grow tired of that constant fight. We grow tired of our worship to God coming together Sunday morning, Sunday afternoon, Wednesday night. And it is a constant thing week after week. And we grow tired. We become lackadaisical in our worship. But even before that, we become lackadaisical in our service to God. We are to worship and serve God, Matthew 4 and verse 10. Many times, the lackadaisical service is not seen until the lackadaisical worship. We don't see the evidence of it, even though it's there. We quit serving. We quit helping others. We, quit, we stop doing what God wants us to do in living the Christian life. Why? Because it is a constant struggle. That person striving for the Olympics. No doubt it's a constant struggle. It's easy to, well, let me just take a day off in their training. Or, you know, that uh, cake or that pie looks really good. It won't matter. And one transgression like unto that sets back weeks of training. And it becomes too hard for them. And so they quit. They first become lackadaisical in that effort and in that striving. And finally, they just quit. In this Christian living, we must, it takes our very best effort, straining every muscle, every nerve to continue in Christian living because it's easy to allow Satan to take control. It becomes easy to become lackadaisical in our worship and in our service to him. And then we must strive to enter into heaven in Matthew, the seventh chapter, verse 13 and verse 14, Jesus says, To enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the, way, is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth unto destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and, now notice this word, few there be that find it. Are there few that be saved? Question to Jesus. You've got to strive to enter into heaven's home. Because that broad way that leads to destruction, it's an easy way. And if you want to attain heaven's home, you're going to have to strive because there's only a few that will be saved a few that will enter into that straight and narrow way. Paul and Barnabas in, Matthew, or in Acts 13th and 14th chapters go on a missionary journey. Toward the end of that journey, they go back to the congregations or several of the congregations that they had established. And it says in Acts 14 and verse 22, confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith. Now why would they have to exhort them to continue in the faith? Because the temptation is there always to just simply quit, to fall away, to do whatever we want to. But then notice, and that we through much tribulation must enter into the kingdom of God. Way is going to be difficult. It's going to be hard. 
There's a lot of tribulations, a lot of problems that you're going to have in living the Christian life because Satan is a powerful force who's trying to destroy you. And the temptations are strong. And we're going to have to thus strive to enter in. Much tribulation to enter in. So few today, though, sad to say, are willing to actually strive to enter in. To strain every muscle, every nerve, every thought, so that we can attain heaven's home. Those who are Christians do strive, they must strive because of their desire to enter heaven. They are willing to put forth the effort to strain to get there so that they can attain heaven's home. In Revelation, the 22nd chapter and verse 17, It says that the Spirit and the bride say, Come. Let him that heareth say, Come. And let him that is athirst come. And whosoever will, let him take of the water of life freely. There is that water of life. There is heaven's home awaiting those individuals who are willing to strive. Everyone can do it. But not everyone is willing to put forth the effort to do it. And that includes many in living the Christian life, even after they become a Christian, not willing to put forth that effort to attain heaven's home. Yes, strive, because few will enter in. What about you? What about me? Are we striving to enter into heaven's home? Are we striving to live the Christian life, to overcome sin and overcome Satan? Or do we become lackadaisical? Do we become where we just don't really put forth the effort? If you've not obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ to become a Christian, then there's no way that you can strive to enter in. But God has giving that invitation, come. Take of the water of life freely. It's there, it's available for you, if you will, upon hearing, believe in God, believe that Jesus died for your sins. Repent of those sins. Confess Jesus as the Son of God and be baptized in water for the forgiveness of sins. But then, having been raised from that watery grave of baptism with your sins washed away by the blood of Jesus Christ, You must strive as a child of God to enter in. If you have not been striving and you've allowed Satan to enter in once again into your life, and you've not been overcoming sin and temptation within your life, and you see as a child of God you need to repent and come back unto Him, let us pray with you this morning for the forgiveness of your sins so that you can once again begin striving for heaven's own. You need to come, do so as we stand and sing the invitation song.